really don't get a much more perfect place than this. Uh, here we are in Canada, near Montreal, we've come out to uh, fish in the lakes with big pike, but before that, this is actually at the very end of my trip, the second to last day, uh, I want to do one last large pastel of this lake and river scene. Uh, then afterwards we're going for the big pike. Uh, it's been a wonderful trip and I think uh, having now got all the information for the video, uh, when I put this together you'll thoroughly enjoy the whole film where I'm going to demonstrate some pastel, some watercolour, some mixed media which show you a lot about what this northern area, uh, this northern part of Canada is like. This time of the year absolutely superb. Not too many mosquitoes um, but it's been a wonderful stay and a wonderful holiday and I hope you enjoy seeing the whole experience with in this case I've primed uh, hot press watercolour paper with acrylic paint, only a thin coat so that it still takes the uh, pastel, it still has a nice bite to it. Now note that I've already drawn in the basic composition with a very light pastel, now I'm going to work in a very pale blue across the whole sky, block and blend that in with my fingers which will deaden the pastel because pastel needs to be nice and bright and clear and clean and left unrubbed or smudged to give its best effect. Once I've layered this uh, pastel on and rubbed it in, I'll then put fresh pastel over the top in a broken colour technique. Now broken colour is very like the impression that's used, one colour next to another. So if you put little strokes of red and yellow together, not mix red and yellow to make orange, but put little strokes together, from a distance it shimmers and fools the eye and makes it much brighter. Now if we do this with a similar effect with the pastel, so if I scumble, which is using the side of the pastel across the surface of the paper, the little ridges in the paper and the paint and the particles between the pastel particles will allow pastel to go on the surface. So here I go now with other coloured pastels just gently tickling, scumbling other warmer and cool colours over the surface to give a shimmering effect to the sky. In this case I'm putting a very light purple as the sky goes higher up. And if I see that colour elsewhere, I'll also put it elsewhere. So while I've got a pastel in my hand, I'll gradually work that colour up. Then I'll come back to the sky and add further colours until I get the effect of the sky that I want, the brightness. Also in this painting you'll notice that I work from the warms in the foreground to cooler in the background. It's a, a general recipe for making a good landscape. One of the only times this reverses is with the sunset, where you have the warm sunset in the background and the cooler colours in the foreground. Here, my greens in the foreground will be much warmer than the greens in the background. I've already produced the distant hills, and one trick there is to add a mid-blue or a darker blue across the hills first of all and then work up the pale colours over the top. In this case I've used a, a, a la pale ultramarine and then worked some darker Prussian and the very pale mauves and light greens just across the tops of the trees where sunlight is just hitting them in the distance but keeping those greens into cool greens with the very smallest amount of warm. You see I've then come to the pine trees in the middle distance so we have foreground, middle distance, distance as a good again and those are a little warmer still with cools in between and then I come to the grass in the foreground an interesting technique for the grass in the foreground where it's very detailed which looks as if you spent absolutely ages and you haven't is to block in the larger dark areas behind the grass in other words look at the dark shapes there and block in with deep greens and deep blues and whatever warms you might need and then work the very light grass stems over the top from the mid tones to the lightest as you see here Treat a complicated painting like this very much like a jigsaw, it simplifies it so. Put the right shapes in the right places with the right colours relevant one to another next to each other. Test your colours all across the painting constantly to get them right from the very beginning. Do not finish just one part of the painting and then try and do the rest because if that one part is wrong at the beginning, so will the rest be. It's important that you compare one colour, one shape, tones, warms, one to another throughout the entire painting from beginning to end. And so you see we've used our complete armoury of uh, techniques. We've used warm next to cool, we've used light next to dark, we've used rough next to smooth. So we've used these textures and perspective and all of the things that we can use to fool the eye into uh, thinking this is a real scene. But it goes beyond that, it's not just a photograph. We've enjoyed the day, we've enjoyed the mediums, and we've enjoyed using pastel in this, in this way to give a very lively feeling to a painting, to give a feeling to the water, to give a feeling to the grass, to give a feeling to the sky, that photographs don't do. 
I was made welcome by some wonderful people in Quebec. Here, two young couples had brought a, a lovely cottage beside the lake, way out in the woodlands, and they lent us their canoe uh, to go and visit the local beaver dam and the lakes that had been created by the beavers. And afterwards, as the night came on, we sat and had barbecued food. You notice the dried mushrooms there, something very close to my heart from France because collecting the seps as those were and slicing and drying them is something we do here. Much of the landscape there is very similar to that that I uh, have here in France. Also these beautiful mirrored lakes are very similar to my place at Le Paradou here. And at the end of this film I'm going to show you two oil paintings and demonstrate how to paint such places in oils. I didn't have time there and I couldn't take over more of my oil paint stock. So I concentrate on watercolour here and pastels. Whereas at the end of the film I'll do two scenes for you and demonstrate in the studio how to paint oils in scenes like this. The wildlife are tremendous. Uh, not only did we see uh, a lot of wildlife around us, some porcupines, even two bears. Um, this little duck here, this fish-eating duck, uh, was also uh, quite uh, willing to let us get fairly close with the canoe. Now we come up to the beaver dam. Many of the small lakes, a tremendous amount of the small lakes in uh, Canada and Montreal and Quebec uh, are created by the beaver. And here we'll see uh, how the beaver actually creates them, how he swims. He makes his uh, nest underneath the dam and chops down quite large trees with his great incisors, um, chopping them almost like uh, marks with a chisel. You see the trees and you think that somebody's been there with a very sharp steel chisel. Tremendous animals uh, doing a lot of good for the marshland and for the lakes. They simply dam small streams and rivers and then create these lovely areas of lakeland right throughout uh, Canada. But as in most of life, every minus has a plus, every plus has a minus. If you create lots of water, the mosquitoes like it. Equally, you have beautiful places. If you create lots of mosquitoes, the fish like them. So you have lots of fish for the fishermen. And that was great for me going over there. It gave me a chance to sample the uh, pike fishing, the bass and other large species, even some lake trout. And talking of the fishing, here we go now, the first lake, a big lake that I fished on for pike and what a beautiful place. If ever I had a dream of what a Canadian lake would be, here it was. Sunken pine trees, beaver dams, lots of animals, very wild, um, beautiful reflections from the pine trees and clean, clear water. The fish we did catch were beautiful to eat. There was no mud or silt or dirt or pollution, they just tasted wonderful. Pike, um, my first of the Canadian pike on a plug. Ah, oh, yes, good pike. So, I think I've got a lot of room, but. Whoa. A big one? Yeah, nice fish. <laughs> Prepare for the fish because there's not much room with the camera and the fish and the meat. This strange looking device is what the pike was caught on. In fact, it's a wooden lure with a couple of large treble hooks and a little vein at the front to make it wobble. And the pike thinks it's a baby pike and comes and grabs it. So, so they've no sympathy for each other at all. They just eat. Our friends had lent us this canoe and Jeanette knew the area. It wasn't long before she took me up to see a heronry. We could get right up underneath the nest. And you see here, the young were becoming quite adult, quite large. They were a little wary of us, but they were fine. It seems I had arrived at the best time of year, midsummer. There were wonderful butterflies, milkweed, monarchs, swallowtails, and a mass of fungi, and many of which I recognised from France and we were able to eat. Here a porcupine. So whatever interests you have, you're bound to find something wonderful, whether you're an artist, a sculptor, a ceramist, um, or just want to enjoy the beauty of nature.
but as a photographer, a painter and musician, I was in my environment because also my hostess Jeanette was a musician and she played for me uh, and I played my uh, instruments over there as well. Uh, and not only that, but I managed to have a chance to paint a portrait of her whilst she played, which allowed me to use a different style and technique again to try and get the movement and flow uh, of her playing on the piano. I'll demonstrate this to you later in the film. This pretty little fish is called a sun bass. And the next butterfly is a swallowtail. We see these in England and the UK as well, and in France. Well, we're going to go fishing for some bass and decided to catch some small minnows first of all. This is uh, a minnow trap, a little bit of bread in there thrown into the pond and 20 minutes later we come back and it's full of little live minnows which we can use for bait to catch the bigger bass. So, uh, what fish are we going to catch here? Where are we? What lake is this? It's the lake Lachigan, Lachigan Lake. And what fish are we liable to catch here? Lachigan. Which is in English? Bass. Bass. A little bass and another bass behind it. Just don't blow it, look. <laughs> How strange. Bigger one. Yeah, but it's, uh, doesn't, it's territorial. Ben doesn't like him being there. Here he comes. Okay, we have him now. Okay, here we have a small bass. And as you saw just now, even playing the small bass here, there were several other of his friends coming up to see him. There are shoalfish here. We want to get one five, six times his size to keep it. You got him okay? Yeah. You get used to it now. Okay. <laughs> you bring him in. Yeah, here we are. Yeah, He's that's better, a yeah? Good that's one. better fish. We have this fish. Bring him up here. You're good, yes? A nice little bass, just big enough. Just big enough for dinner. That's it. Into your hand. And you can take him off and let him go, yeah? Yeah. Is it on? Yes. I have a fish on the wet fly, uh, a lure, fishing uh, a heavy line, a lead core line down deep for fun. Small bass, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, here it comes. Yeah, little bass on a cat's whisker. You see how lively it is. It's great fun. They're as good as a trout, these bass on the fly. Marvellous. First bass on the fly. Here he comes. Up oh, to me. Lovely, eh? So you've Lovely. seen a bass caught on the fly. And here you have two small perch and a bass, and then the series of the bass we caught that day. They were later grilled on a small fire with uh, tin foil, and you'll see that on the film later too. Delicious, they were. I wonder if these were spares for Father Christmas this year in case he wears his old ones out. And you're never quite sure what you're going to see where, but here are some lynx, the wild cat of the North Americas. Not something you want to come across face to face. And now we come back to painting again, another pastel, this one to be done near to Jeanette's son's little cabin in the woodland. I felt the yellow canoe was very useful because it gave a bright colour amongst all of the other colours to uh, centre my colours around. 
Once again, I'm going to use the acrylic uh, coated paper. It's a nice, quick and efficient way to work. A smaller sheet this time. It took me about 40 minutes to do in the end. Here you see the set of Unison pastels that I use. A nice simple box uh, in the, in the uh, actual box that Unison uh, send that quantity in. Again, a very quick drawing with light pastel. Nothing too detailed, just enough to know where I'm going to place my colours. Working up the horizon first, which again is where many of the mid-tones are. And although I'm going to block and blend as before, I'm also going to use a technique called feathering. Feathering is using the pastel with short diagonal strokes. Uh, so you put little tiny strokes one by another. I still do some blending before adding fresh colour over the top. In this case I've got to do a nice blue sky with white fluffy clouds scudding over. I tend to follow the Impressionist method. I never use pure black and I never use pure white. I go to very, very light colours, especially in painting uh, with the black, because black deadens everything if you use it as a colour or you use it in mixing. This does not mean to say that black can't be used as a colour or can't be used very, very powerfully and strongly. Uh, I've used it in a palette called the Rembrandt palette where black becomes blue and you use colours in such a sequence uh, that next to each other they look quite different. But for my way of painting uh, with direct colours, I prefer to avoid black altogether. In oils, to make a very dark colour, I tend to use very deep blues such as Prussian or Ultramarine and add warms to those until I get a very dark that can be warm or cool and uh, to the direction I need. Even the background on these paintings aren't black. It's a very, very deep blue or deep purple, which sings out through the colours on top. But notice how I'm looking at the variety of blues and greens here. Greens can be both warm and cool. A cool green would be a turquoise green, a bluey green, a warm green would be a brownie green. So we can play with this variety of mixing and greens in paint. And of course the same with pastel, you can mix pastel. But as I've already said, be careful when mixing. Don't blend too much and don't smudge. Try and mix cleanly, colour into one another. You can blend a little at first, but your last coats must be fresh, must be clean. This means that feathering and scumbling have to be uh, a better method than trying to blend with your fingers. I've already given you hints about foreground, middle distance and distance. I've already told you about the detail in the foreground. I've already told you about warms and cools. And I've talked about working like a jigsaw, comparing one piece to another throughout the painting, constantly comparing one colour to another, making sure that each shape and colour is relevant one to another. Here you'll notice I'm doing just that. I'm blocking, I'm doing all the bigger areas of painting, I'm comparing, and then gradually working the details up at the end. I don't start with my details and then finish loosely. The trick is, you start loose, you finish as tight as you want. If you start tight, you can't go anywhere else. If you start loose, you can finish whenever you wish and as tightly as you wish. Another little trick with reflections is not to do all the horizontal strokes first. Work up your vertical strokes first, work up your depths of reflections, and then finish with your horizontals going across. A little more difficult in watercolour where you may have to lift paint out or use dry brush work, but in oils, acrylics or pastels it's quite easy to put on the horizontals afterwards. And so I finish this little study, done in about 30 or 40 minutes. Very pleasant, a nice time, and you catch the moment, you catch the time, you catch the atmosphere of the day, you catch the light. You have to work quickly to do this. You have to have techniques that uh, you can produce the painting within two hours because after two hours the light can change so much you can lose everything. I think you might enjoy the play of different blues and greens here. As I was saying, the warm blues against the cool blues, the turquoise ceruleans against the ultramarines and cobalt blues, and the same with the greens. And here we are back in the woods with those little bass we caught, baking them in the tin foil on a log fire next to that same lake. They were absolutely delicious. And if more wood is needed for the fire, well, there's plenty around.
we decided to drive a couple of hours further away from Montreal and found this lovely old uh, lake which had been deserted by the beavers and then a little below it uh, where one of the beavers lakes had completely dried out but left this stream going through in a few pools. An ideal place for a pastel. There were some wonderful reds and oranges and browns on the lake bed as it dried out. This is the composition I chose, which has the lake to the right and then links in with the stream to the left, so it gives a double composition going off each side of the paper. I've set up quite comfortably, but uh, in some situations you can't sit. You have to be able to stand to see over the scene you want to paint. And with my bad back, that's not such a good idea. Which is another good reason for me to paint very quickly. OK, we're about uh, 60 kilometres north of Montreal, and I'm going to do a second but larger pastel. Uh, we've got a dried lake behind us. There's been beaver activity around here. Um, I'll show you a stick later on which has been gnawed by the beavers and a little piece of dam. As yet we haven't found uh, a live dam, if you call it that. We haven't found beavers that are actually there. I want to film them before I go if possible, but if not, no matter. So I'm going to do a large pastel again on uh, an acrylic background. Um, hopefully in about, let's see, it's 12 o'clock now, midday, about two hours possibly for this big one. So once again you can see I've started with a very basic line drawing in light pastel and I'm going for the horizon and the sky. OK, I'm going to start with the horizon, because for me that's where I find my mid-tones, usually where the land meets the sky here. I'm going to put a light blue on first of all, and then blend in some other colours to give me the right tones as I go along. As I've got a fairly textured surface, for some of it I'm going to have to rub the pastel in and blend it more. And we call this blocking and then blending. So we block a colour in and then we blend it <coughs> and afterwards put more colour over the top. And the thing with pastel is that it works by little tiny crystals of colour. And if you rub it, it deadens it. So when we finish, we need our last coats of pastel to be untouched, not rubbed. The first coats are fine, and we need now to get these nice fluffy white clouds in. And we don't want them too white. Um, they're actually quite warm, so I'm going to use a bit of cream coming through behind the mountain here at first, just lightly, just to find the lighter areas. The clouds are moving fairly quickly, so I've got to work quite fast or I'm going to have a constantly changing mass of cloud on me. Just touching the tip of the pastel onto the uh, board, you see. Mm. 
we're fairly well covered in anti-mosquito liquid at the moment because there are a lot of mustique around here. Le beaucoup moustique. Oui, parce que dans le coin des tourbières, ce genre de lac, nous l'appelons les tourbières. C'est des vieux lacs qui sont en train de se refermer parce que la nature environnante est très compacte et enlève l'oxygène. Just establishing some of the colours over the whole picture now. Start to add some of these warms into it now. And I can get the feeling of the cools and warms together and just how warm I've got to go. It's like anything, it's the opposites in life. If you want uh, something to look rougher, then you make something smoother next to it. If you want something cooler, then you add something warmer next to it. So if I want this to look a cooler brown, then I add a slightly warmer orange around it. You see how that pushes that back then? lighter yellow, green, find where these reflections are in the edge of the water here and pick out the bits of sunlight where it is on these trees. And so you can see how I've built up this painting, as I've said to you, just like a jigsaw, quite a complicated picture, but by comparing one colour to another, by getting one shape right, fitting one next to another with the correct colours, the painting just appears as if we're putting pieces of a jigsaw together. And there we are, a large pastel done in quite a short space of time to capture the atmosphere, the heat and the moment.
when I produce these films and travel, I also like to show you as much as I can about the country. While I was there, it was a celebration for Montreal. And like the French, being mainly French, they have a love for fireworks, which I also enjoy. And they put on this spectacular display, even in the little village that we were staying in. So I can't, wouldn't imagine what the big cities could have been like. But it wasn't all one-sided. I also took some of my English recipes over there to them and cooked to my friends and their families over there. In this case, a nice big traditional English roast. <laughs> I find it hard enough understanding French in France, but understanding uh, Quebec French is even harder with the accent and how it just blends one word into another. Oh, maybe it's a perch, I'm not sure. As we travelled around the country we found many delightful little streams and what you noticed all of the time was the clarity of the water. Here we were in midsummer and everywhere was possible to swim. I swam in this lake in front of my friend's house, the same friends that lent me the canoe we went fishing in. And also then we found this beautiful cascade, this big waterfall, uh, a few miles away. Uh, it took quite a walk to get to it, but well worth it. Uh, we'd taken our swimming stuff and when we got there, there were crowds of people there. But still plenty of space for all, plenty for me and plenty for them. We just went a little bit further up to the Cascades and enjoyed our own little private pools. I imagined in Canada that the water would be absolutely freezing and icy cold, but in fact it was very warm, certainly no cooler than the rivers over here. And back to calmer waters. Here at the lake just in front of my friend's house where you saw me bathing just now, I found this rather lovely corner with these branches overhanging and uh, a beautiful reflections. In Hi, well I'm going to have a go now with um, the watercolour aquarelle. And I'm going to use a china black pencil first of all to draw in all of these lovely branches of the pine tree here that's overhanging the view. It's almost framing it in. We've got lots of little textures here on the water's edge as well, which is rather nice. So I'll use a China Graph pencil first, which is just black and it's waterproof, and then I'll be able to just it loosely afterwards. The problem to show you how it works here is going to be the light on the paper. What I was just saying there was it won't be easy to demonstrate to you because the sunlight is coming through the trees behind me and making the paper very mottled. This is my China Graph pencil, uh, which I shall use to draw the branches in first of all. Hopefully you can just see the pencil marks now on this. 
not easy in this light. Um, but I've worked up my main darks and some of the twisting pattern of this uh, old pine tree coming over. I'm always ready to start just very loosely painting in the water. So I've done my preliminary drawing with very strong China Graph pencils, then worked up with standard watercolour washes and finished with a little pastel at the very end. But I'll show you more about watercolour as we go on in two other paintings. This was simply to show you another technique and the use of the China Graph pencil. Now we're taking a trip further north. Uh, we're going to look at some salmon rivers and see about catching some larger trout. The landscape changes to vast acreages of flat landscape, uh, great for the farming. We stopped at a smokery and tried some of the local herrings or the kippers. Very strong, very hard, nothing like our English ones. Even so, they were extremely tasty, very rich, you couldn't eat too much. But the rows were also sold separately and smoked, as they did mussels. Although you could eat them raw smoked, just as you see here, you could also use the English method of boiling them lightly, so they were a little more tender. Like Australia, you could drive for miles and miles and miles, and you came upon these little villages. The houses tended to be fairly small because there wasn't a lot of money up there, not much to be made, and also for winter fuel, the long winters, to have large houses to have to try and heat. We found a nice local campsite, quite reasonably priced, and uh, managed to find some local mushrooms too as well to go with our breakfast. These were delicious fried in a little butter and a small amount of garlic. I put on my waders and decided to try this delightful little stream. They're only very small trout, but they were American brook trout and quite pretty. I caught six. They were all rather small. Uh, my hostess said we should eat them because they were the size that they normally took there and didn't get much bigger. But I decided I'd like something a little larger later. So I just enjoyed the fishing and the scenery. Painting moving water is very difficult, possibly better done with something that's very lively like pastel. But it is possible with watercolour. A bit later in this video we go to a different falls and I'll show you with watercolour a small painting I did a quick study of, that of some huge falls. Even though the trout were very small I still enjoyed the fishing very much and uh, the tradition of fly fishing like this with a dry or wet fly and I was able to use both that day was very pleasurable and not a chance I get to do so much over here in France. Then we had a choice of two very large rivers. This one, where they only charged approximately £30 a day to fish for salmon, but you had to put all the salmon back. That's not a bad idea, but at that time of year we gathered there weren't that many fish about, and we uh, preferred to fish for trout in a lake further up in the mountains, much more wild, uh, than actually take our chance to fish for the salmon there. But what a beautiful river. I mean, if you had to pay for a stretch of this in Scotland on a salmon river, you'd be paying thousands of pounds for a day, not just 30 pounds. And there's quite a large link here between the sea and the rivers because you have the sea fish just outside the estuary but you also have these tremendous big fish called sturgeon. 
which is where the caviar comes from. And in many of the big rivers, massive sturgeon come upstream. It is possible to catch them on rod and line, and some anglers uh, specialise in that. But they are a massive fish. We decided to go down to this little harbour and have a go for little cucumber smelts, very small silver fish that actually smell of cucumbers and delicious for breakfast. And here is our catch. Not exactly a huge salmon and not many, but very tasty. That evening as the tide went out, Jeanette took me to another bay that she knew, very pretty. And as the sun set and we drank a glass of wine or two, sitting on some deck chairs, I decided to have a sudden go at a large watercolour. The sky was uh, very cloudy, very atmospheric, rain was passing by, but I just felt like having a, a nice big tussle with a huge piece of paper. You want to watch? So we start with the sky. And I mean, I want to make up this sky slightly, so I'm going to make special effects over here. Um, the trouble is, the sky is going to change so much anyway, and I'm going to use a nuker at first to get light here. This is uh, raw sienna, which is quite a nice colour. I'm letting it dribble. I'm using a 200 pound rough paper. Um, in this case I don't need to stretch it because it's so heavy and hard and I've got a hate brush, a small round brush and a little sword. Those are the only three brushes I need for a painting like this, a bit like Ron Ransom. Normally you mix up your colours before a big painting like this so you have enough, you know. I need a clean area. Now I'm just going to water. You can let the, the trickling of this water give the effect of the sky, you see. I've already wet the paper slightly so that it should, should there shouldn't be too many dry marks, although we are getting quite a few dry marks here, which is not really what I want to get. Do some light red. As you can tell by the wind on the microphone, we're working in very rough conditions, which is great fun, it's very exciting, and it's what painting out of doors is about, surely. Painting in different conditions, a different medium to suit the different uh, conditions, light and weather and atmosphere. Here, um, I'm only using a limited set of colours. Either light red or uh, Indian red would do, burnt sienna equally. Um, I'm using raw sienna rather than yellow ochre, um, ultramarine, cobalt and a little Prussian blue. And that basically will get me through with all I need. I may use a little viridian at the very end because I can't quite get the greens that I want otherwise. There's too much wind for me to put the board up on the easel so I'm just leaning it on the ground against the easel and kneeling down and painting and enjoying. We don't have to be in sheer comfort and everything else to enjoy painting. I'm thoroughly enjoying my time with this. Um, I don't have quite as much control with a big ca uh, paper like this with it being at an angle, so the paint is going to constantly trickle down. But I shall use that to effect, and this is what it's about. We use what is called controlled accident. Don't try and be too pretty pretty or prissy with a painting like this. Just let the paint do the work. You know watercolour is going to dry lighter when it dries than it is when you put it on. So pile the paint in, let it uh, flow, let it blend one thing into another and understand and feel the paint. Now depending, you can, if you paint uh, with the board flat, you can control the amount this dribbles, yeah? Understand? And, uh, and I'm not. Uh, I just want to get these lovely loose effects, except for that stain mark there, which I'm not happy with, but I don't mind it, not to do. I want to go a bit darker still, so we'll take some 
more sienna and night. It's lovely to hear. Yeah, we've got a lovely light coming tonight to last a little longer before the rain does actually hit. And you can work the darker and darker in while it's still wet. It still dribbles down with these lovely effects. So we get this storm coming. Let's go. That'll do. Right. Feel some rain coming, which is not going to help me, but I'll well, still go for it. I'll have to try and dry the painting off a bit here where the hills and mountains are coming. Pull back and paint in. Here you see me lifting out the paint slightly on the horizon by drying my brush and taking away some of that wet paint. Let's remember that my videos aren't about beginner's painting lessons. They're about sharing experience. Yes, I hope you'll learn about painting from my videos. Yes, I hope it will give you the incentive to go and paint, to feel free to try these things. But I hope you'll enjoy sharing the experience that I have as a painter actually being out there, not just painting from photographs indoors, not just in perfect conditions as so many videos do. This is not sterile. This is a real artist out there painting real things with real problems and if I can do it surely you can and I hope you want to. So a few flecks of rain coming out of the shrine but really quickly here. So yes we have lorries going by, it's not ideal. No, I'm not wearing a radio mic. This is how it was. Later on in the video we'll sit in the studio in silence and peace and I'll go through step by step with techniques and oil painting and so on. And in many of the other demonstrations I do. But here we are, um, me giving you the experience of that moment. So having got my nice loose sky, I now work down through the water and into some of the bank and surrounding edges. I can use a little bit of dry brushwork here too because it's a nice rough paper so I can scumble some of the light reflections across it. The thing is to keep everything very fluid. So this simple palette really is beautiful to use. Ultramarine, Prussian blue, cobalt, burnt sienna and raw sienna are just our very basics and with that we can produce a very lovely moody low light picture. You can see here the difference in the two blues from top to bottom and the way that with working some of the warms into them they change completely. If you see what the rain does if it hits it, it ruins it. So it's very quick. To travel to these places all over the world and paint, I have to keep my tackle to a minimum. So, you know, one or two little video cameras, a tripod, uh, basic sets of paints, uh, keep, keeping just a very simple travel kit. It's a shame that those spots of rain because they totally spoil a watercolour. dry enough to watercolour also has to be controlled, you have to dry enough for me to... And we all have our ups and downs, we all become demoralised and I'm getting rather fed up here because as I'm painting I'm seeing my work being destroyed by more and more rain suddenly appearing and blotting on the paper. There's nothing you can do about it, I mean one, two, three spots of rain and you can't uh, work into it or, or, or freshen it up. What I do decide to do here is be very brave and just totally work over the whole thing again. I had three choices. One was to destroy it, another was to work pastel over the top, which is another very good way of working on an overworked watercolour or damaged watercolour. Pastel over the top can be worked with uh, soft pastel, this is, can be worked with water or can just be blended. But my third choice, and the one I went for, was to just take heavier washes of colour and work them straight over again, in similar places, but just to brush straight into the existing damp paint underneath and lose all that speckled effect. Although in fact, I did quite like some of the effect and just left it showing as I came down towards the bottom of the sky. 
So often in painting, especially an uncontrolled painting like this, especially a painting where you're working with the environment and not just carefully planning a photograph or doing an illustration, you feel like throwing it over your shoulder. You have to really work through difficult times. And that's often when the best of you comes out. That's when under pressure you turn out your best stuff. If we just turn out what we know we can do all the time, we don't gain anything, we don't learn, we don't progress, we don't move forward. Experimentation and exploring and taking risks are where we move forward. Now I begin to play a bit more with the dry brushwork, leaving some lighter areas and also lost and found edges. With watercolour, if we paint wet next to wet, it blends. If we paint wet into wet, it blends. If we paint wet next to dry, it leaves a hard edge. If we paint wet over dry, it leaves a hard edge. So here I'm playing between those areas of wet next to wet into wet and wet against dry. Whilst the paint is still damp, I start to put in the distant mountains, working from the top edges so that they will just gently uh, drift downwards and become more blurry into mist. This is where we can also use the technique of blending. So having done that heavier area of paint, I can clean my brush and with a little more clean water or thin paint, just blend it gently down into the existing paint below. Something I feel I have to say as a teacher is people say, oh, isn't watercolour the most difficult of the techniques? In some ways, uh, yes, but only in the fact that I can teach any technique almost by painting by numbers. But the difference in watercolour is that you have to understand the medium far more, you have to feel it. So although I can say, right, take your brush, take that bit of paint and put it on there with oil paint, um, it's just a sensitivity of brush and how you place it, it's not so difficult. With watercolour, understanding how much it will spread, how much paint you need, how wet the paper needs to be, when the paper needs to be dry, having an actual feel and understanding for the medium which only comes with practice, practice, practice. Yes, you need to understand the techniques. Yes, you need to know the methods. But none of those and none of that teaching, no videos, no books, will surpass you actually doing it. You need to throw away dozens. You need to have lots of paper and keep trying, trying, trying until you get the feel of the medium and know what it will do. This is why I use that phrase controlled accident because how can you have an accident and how can you control it? You will let the paint do the work for you. You know, you could paint the painting upside down, you could tilt the paper to get a different uh, flow of the um, rain coming down through the clouds. As I did a second layer here of painting, I could have painted the first sky, then come in with a second painting of the sky and tilted it another direction, just in one cloud area, to have another cloud coming with rain in a different direction altogether. There's so many things you can experiment with and enjoy. Don't be stuck just with one technique or one way that somebody says is correct. You know, I had one student say to me once, I hated that teacher because she said I had to use my brush from left to right only. Yeah, how stupid can you get? There's no one way to be right. There's no one right answer. There are so many ways that can be right. Yes, there are things that certainly don't work. Yes, there are things that can go wrong in watercolour and there are things you have to avoid. You can use cauliflowers, for instance, where the paint isn't quite dry enough and you, you start painting and it forms a cauliflower. But it may be you want those effects. So which is right? It's right when you get what you want, when the effect is right when the painting is right at the end of it all. The basics of watercolour are that we're not going to use a white paper, we're not going to use white paint. So if I want pink, I use thin red. If I want a cream, I use thin yellow. Here you can see that we work up using the light of the paper with a very transparent medium. Watercolour is one of the most transparent. It's very, very fine pigment. So we, we want to keep this freshness, we want to keep this luminosity. It mustn't become dead or overworked and a painting can very easily be that. This technique of using wet into wet uh, does help us not to get that uh, overworked uh, feeling because it's very spontaneous. Using three brushes now, we've used the hake, a uh, one inch hake, and uh, I'm going to use a couple of a round and a sword just to finish off. To talk further about using watercolour and its luminosity, as I worked down the sky you saw I gradually added more paint. As it soaked in, I added more. As I added more pigment into the paint it became darker as well. Now if the paint was totally dry, we could add a glaze over it. What I did first of all was a wash of clean water and then several linked graduated washes of colour into that wet paper. What I'm doing afterwards is adding 
gradually heavier amounts of pigment uh, by putting paint into that, wet into wet, into that previous glaze. Then as the paint dries gradually, I can uh, add more paint into it and make it darker and darker. And when the paint is totally dry, I could have very hard edges. So to run through it again and explain a little more clearly, uh, a wash could be just putting a clean layer of water with a brush onto the paper. It could be applying water with a little paint into it onto the paper. It could be working from top to bottom with a uh, gradually changing amount of paint in that water. So we might add a little more paint in the first amount of brush strokes and as we come down the paper have more water and less pigment. That's a wash. A glaze would be using a thin amount of paint in water over the top of an already dry uh, wash. So if we let our wash dry and then put a thin layer of watercolour over the top, that would be a glaze. Wet into wet is painting wet paint into wet paint. And the wetter the paint underneath is, the wetter the paper, the further it will spread, either outwards or down, depending on the angle of the paper. Wet into dry or wet on to dry will give you a hard edge and wet next to wet will blend. Wet next to a hard edge as you overlap will give a harder line on that hard edge. But these are all things you need to experiment with and explore. Well here we've been painting a nice stormy day with the rough sky and the rain coming through. Let's say though that you wanted to paint a nice bright sunny day with a few fluffy white clouds. OK, here's the technique, using a very similar one to the wet in wet above. Lay the board flat so the paint doesn't dribble downwards and paint the water, clean water, around the outside edge of one of your white fluffy cloud shapes. If you then paint a blue watercolour around that, depending how wet the watercolour is and how far into the uh, water line you paint it around your cloud, the paint will spread into itself. So wet next to wet will spread into each other and you'll be left with a lovely light fluffy edge to a white cloud. That's just a very basic beginning. Another method would be to actually lift the paint out. So if you painted a blue sky and took a, a damp brush and lifted out the paint, or better still, took a sponge, a sea sponge, and lifted out the paint, before it dried, you'd be left with a light inner edge and a soft fluffy outer edge. So there's two techniques. The paper will also make a lot of difference. We've talked about smooth and rough papers, but also different makes of paper differ. Paper has uh, a size mixed in with it so that it becomes less porous because ordinary paper just made straight off from trees without being uh, blanched white uh, would be very absorbent almost like blotting paper so different papers have different qualities and different absorbances as well oh heavens there's so much to take in isn't there and that's where uh, a good teacher or another artist or having friends that know about this or reading books or videos come in I and many others have produced videos for the beginner and this video isn't really for that. Yes, I hope that many people seeing it might be inspired to begin painting or learn new techniques or even paint from it. Uh, this one is really meant for the intermediate or just to thoroughly enjoy sharing the experience. Now back to this painting. As you see, as the paint dries, I'm able to add in stronger and stronger colours and gradually, as the paint dries more, the edges of my brush marks become sharper so that in fact if the painting were completely dry I'd be able to put on sharp lines with the fine brushes and that's what I keep my fine brushes for at the very end just to put in a indicate some details we want to let the eye and the mind do quite a bit of the work it's not producing a photograph it's totally different to a photograph it's an atmosphere it's an impression it's a feeling it's about the medium it's about the light it's about the beauty of watercolor Now we go upriver in search of a very strange fish. It looks like a cross between a pike and a perch. It has a sort of body of a long perch with the stripes, but the head and especially the teeth of a pike. 
Unfortunately, it had rained heavily, and although the lakes aren't too affected by this, the river certainly was. And we had, were fishless for the day, but it was a beautiful day. Anyway, here's what they look like, a dark sander lurking through the uh, bottom of a river, waiting to jump on his prey. But moving away from this wonderful countryside, let's go into the city and take a look at what Montreal is like. We decided first of all to go to the Chinatown and had some delightful food in a restaurant there, went shopping in the Chinese supermarkets and looked at the beautiful and fantastic uh, variety of articles in the shops around there. Much as I was tempted, I wasn't able to buy anything from the shops and take with me because I'd already reached my maximum baggage allowance for the stuff I'd taken over. Carrying paints and fishing tackle and everything else, even if you keep to the minimum, is still going to work out at quite a lot. Talking about travel and certain airlines, let me give you a few tips, two things mainly. The first being that certain airlines allow certain materials and certain don't. British Airways used to allow some oil paints and some of the American airlines wouldn't. Um, certain airlines will allow you to take hairspray with you, uh, but they won't allow you to take fixative. And you can use f uh, ordinary hairspray for a fixative anyway. So you need to find out before you leave what materials you can take with you. I never take oil paints these days. The pastels are inert, watercolours are okay, acrylics are okay. The second thing is insurance. Be very careful about your travel insurance. I had cameras damaged in my uh, hand luggage, which would have been covered if they were in the ordinary baggage, but weren't as in hand luggage. It would be stupid to put them in the ordinary baggage because they would have been damaged. So you need to take out special insurance possibly. Although I love seeing nature in its natural state and wildlife out of doors, this biodome in uh, Montreal is tremendous. Uh, they've worked out the uh, situations for the animals naturally, look after them beautifully, and in a series of controlled environments you can see everything from the animals of that country through to a polar experience and even into the jungle. So we were able to go around for an hour and a half, two hours, and look at animals that were quite happy and behaving quite naturally and even breeding. The whole place has been very well designed, not only for the animals but also for the people, for the public. The walkways are clear and easy, very few steps, and there is wheelchair access around the whole dome. But now let's move from this wonderful simulation back into nature. Here we have already a turtle or terrapin back in one of the marshes near home. So now we're going for a little catfish. We have some small sun bass as well, which we catch enough of, we can fill it. But these little uh, catfish will also make a very nice meal.
and now these wonderful big Quebec Rapids I spoke about earlier. Let's try a little watercolour study here. I start off with a little pencil sketch. It's not going to be that easy because the light's constantly changing and uh, also there's a lot of spray from the waterfall which will keep the watercolour very wet and it won't allow me to get things dry quickly to be able to paint the hard edges. Starting with the sky, the wet into wet sky, I told you already about this idea of painting white clouds by painting the colour around the white paper, wet white paper and letting the light area stay in the middle. Here we're going to see something like that being done. So what I've done is to tint the lighter bits of white paper where the white clouds are and you can see where I've painted the light blues around the clouds leaving them light and fluffy and soft. Then I've worked down with my yellows and very pale bluey greens into the background uh, trees to make them more in the distance. Gradually coming forward, painting wet into wet, just areas of branches and trees uh, of the uh, warmer coloured greens and leaves in the foreground. Sometimes I'm putting in yellows and brighter colours first and then working the darker colours around them. We always in watercolour work from light to dark. This would have been an ideal time to use some masking fluid. Masking fluid is liquid latex that you can paint onto the paper so that once the paint is dry you can strip the fluid off and the paper remains white underneath. It means that very fine details can be left white without having to use white paint afterwards. I didn't have that with me on this trip so I've had to leave the white areas of paper to try and get the effect of the foam and all the spray and the cascade at the end of the painting. I've talked to you about using a sponge as well. You can buy little packets of cheap sea sponges even at the seaside, but in some art shops they're very expensive. If we use a sponge and a little bit of watercolour on the edge of it, we can make some wonderful textures for spray or for leaves, for trees, branches, grasses. You should try and experiment with these sometime if you haven't. So it's my usual very loose way of working, pure colours as much as possible, wet into wet, and then gradually as the paint dries and I come to the foreground, I start to tighten up the edges and put more detail in, gradually working back into the darker edges of the painting. So for instance around leaves I can paint dark hollows to make the lighter coloured leaves I've already painted stand out. Now we drive way up into one of the national parks. We had to drive 60 kilometres down a really rough old dirt track uh, once we bought our tickets to fish here to get to this lake, uh, miles from anywhere. Once we got there, there were a few nice uh, little cottages for the fishermen and so on, but uh, it really was a lake in the middle of nowhere. These are what we were going to go for, the big lake trout. We didn't see anything nearly as big as this, but on the way I did see two bears, which was rather fun, and a few other strange little animals. Anyway, here we were, and the fishermen hadn't caught much at all. We managed to pull a few small lake trout out, which were great for dinner. My hostess even caught this surprise catch, a small carp. Jeanette is a very good pianist and also a composer. She has composed very complicated works indeed and I've heard these on disc. I'm just an amateur musician, so although I may make up for it on my art side, she certainly far surpassed me with the music. But we thought we'd have a little fun together and try a few tunes. And then uh, I was so inspired by seeing her play there that I thought I'd like to try a portrait of her and to capture the movement of her hands and her body and the atmosphere.
I decided to use pastel again, but this time straight onto white watercolour paper and with the use of water. So I was using it just like a paint. I put some pastel onto the paper and then with a big brush and water could blend it, could paint it like uh, poster paint or watercolour and then work over it. It's a very strong, rapid way to work. I intended being fairly abstract at first, but because I started loose it meant I could pull back more tightly. It also meant I wasn't bound by having to paint every little piano key or everything in detail. I could make it much looser. And I only started with a few bare marks of drawing, but then it was straight in with a brush and water because I know with pastel and watercolour you can work over it. So quite clearly I'm not trying to make a literal presentation, I'm just getting the feel of the whole thing. This was my big chance. We return to the Lake of the Big Pike. The first part of this film, when you see the fish, is a very big fish I'd lost, well over £20. Got it almost to the side of the boat and the lure came out. Then I went back again on this day and we caught another fish, almost as big, a good £20 plus, um, but it made up the piece of film and it made up for the trip. Uh, my last big fish of my trip over there from Quebec. A wonderful experience and a wonderful pike. Right, we have another pike on our way back on a small silver lure. Feels like quite a good, good fish this one. A bit drifting down with the wind. It's been a wonderful day. And uh, this fish is just about 20 yards from me now, coming around. I think it's a bit bigger than the last one. There we go, that's better. Now I have control. Here he comes. Oh, a big fish. Yeah. That's a good one. I should think about 20 pounds. It's a big head. Yeah. So now we move to photographs and the last pike, which wasn't quite as big, but was still a lovely fish. Unfortunately the video camera had a slight fault at this time and we couldn't uh, finally film that one, but we did take these shots with the still camera. Well, here we are, finished of the holiday, had a wonderful time just been out on my second to last day and caught a fish here about 20 pounds so I hope you enjoyed the film and all the painting in between it gives you an idea of this break to Canada but I also have to say a very big thank you to my friend Jeanette here who is also a, uh, 
a, a musician and a, a writer of music and an artist as well. And she's given me this wonderful holiday. We've had a great time together, haven't we? Yeah, been good. And she's caught some fish too.